Yo guys, what is good? So welcome back to my YouTube channel We're here with Joe Jeffrey. Again, hopefully you guys saw the video on my Instagram where we spoke about peak week strategies. Uh, strategy, sorry. So today we're going to talk about training considerations, training programming. Um, if you guys don't already know, uh, do a bit of a whiz when it comes to training programming. I wanted to pick his brains about a few different bits and bobs. So I kind of wanted to speak to you today. Well, firstly, I'll let you start with regards to when you're programming for, say, We'll talk more about bodybuilders because obviously mm. a bodybuilder, a lot of guys that follow me will be bodybuilders, classic guys, whatever. When you um, program for someone, what are some of the main considerations that you would sort of take into into consideration when, when programming? So it's important to put context on this probably when I program for someone is like the cohort of my clients are advanced trainees <coughs> already. So their requirements of things like volume and, and mm -hmm. the need to periodize training properly mm -hmm. is, is far more important than a gen pop individual. You know, like a, a novice trainee could, could get away with just about anything. Sure. You know, and, and, yeah. and find progression. It just needs some stimulus for adaptation. That's right, yeah. So we need to be a little bit more nuanced with <coughs> how we manage things like fatigue and how we accumulate fatigue and how we dissipate fatigue and specifically where that fatigue goes mm -hmm. is pretty important. Um, I mean, I've definitely been there where I've just been like, I am battered. And it's like, you need to kind of then have that ability to know when to pull, when to push, and how mm. to change things. Mm. So yeah, let's carry on. So, the needs of the athlete mm. are important, but there's some basic tenets of hypertrophy that are just uh, across the board accepted. Like, there's a dose-response relationship of training volume in hypertrophy, mm -hmm. up to a degree, there's a dose-response relationship of training frequency in hypertrophy, and there's a dose-response relationship of your proximity to failure in hypertrophy. And then, and then the question becomes, how do we balance all of these to create the greatest sum of all of them whilst managing fatigue mm -hmm. and how do we get the greatest quality of all of these if the requirements are such that we need to be specific about the balance of that so maybe the best initial thing would be discover what's minimally effective for you mm -hmm. as a genetically unique individual and you can use markers like um now these are not perfect by any means but they're, they're called <coughs> like soreness mm -hmm. um like your pump in terms of how much metabolite accumulation you're driving, because we know that that's a driver of hypertrophy. If you're getting a pretty good pump, there's a good chance that yeah, yeah, you're getting yeah. some gross sure. response. Um, and over the course of a mesocycle, performance. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, um, how much shorter is your proximity to failure with the progression scheme that you have in place? So that might be worth noting. With my clients within their programming, um, I would never have like, try to add a rep or like try to put some load on the bar. We have a progression scheme in place for each movement that will include, you know, somewhere there may be an addition to a, uh, of a set, uh, somewhere there may be addition of load, somewhere there may be addition of a rep, but it will be already down, and then there'll be data drawn from that, like, well, I actually had to get to one rep in reserve to hit that progression when I expected to, okay. and that's a marker to, to track. But sorry, I've gone a bit ahead of myself there. So <laughs> firstly, discovering, <laughs> discovering what's minimally effective, yeah, i.e. Yeah, yeah. the the smallest amount that you need to do to get some degree of disruption. Okay, cool. And like you say, it's not just a case of always just adding load to the bar because mm -hmm. I presume, well, and I've obviously been there myself, as we probably all have, it gets to the point of diminishing returns. Like where, how many more plates can you put on that bar? Mm. So how do you then increase that stimulus? What would you then do with your clients? Yeah, so there's many vectors of hypertrophy to understand and, and we come back to the balance. So the example you gave there is a more injurious one. Mm -hmm. It's like if we were trying to add 20 kilos of load. Let's say we have this kind of net stimulus here. We have like two sets on the Cybex hack, right? And <laughs> um, we're trying to find progression, but load progression is something that we've identified as injurious. Mm -hmm. Maybe we tried to just add 1.25 kilos. Um, maybe we would add a rep per set. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe we would add a set within a relative proximity to failure. And um, you know, like we were speaking about earlier, almost like adding volume seemed like taboo, but it's something that comes with great utility for me with clients. When, when adding volume, would you, for example, would you build that up over the course of a couple of weeks, say to like we start with one set, then mm. we start with two, and then we end up with maybe three sets on the hack squat, and then bring it back down again in say week four or something like that? Yeah, so the smartest way to program would be to have an accumulation of everything. Yeah, yeah. To have an accumulation of your proximity to failure, your volume landmarks, <coughs> um, your load, 
everything would have an accumulation that would come to a point of ideally functionally overreaching in the last week of your mesocycle that can objectively be tracked quite easily. And then you would deload, mm -hmm. you would then get some super compensation if you've overreached the way that you should, and then you could start all over again with new data. So if you're gonna add volume, you need to be sure that it's within what is your adaptive capability. Stuff you can recover from, right? otherwise yeah. you end up in that hole. It's yeah, quite unrecoverable. Yeah, so if we use that example and you were doing two <coughs> sets of, of the Cybex hack on a Monday mm -hmm. and you got a little, a little bit of a pump, the next day kind of sore but you were recovered by the end of the next day, quite clearly there's room for additional adaptation in there. So we could quite easily move you to three sets and know that it's not going to be deleterious to your ability to perform on Thursday yeah, yeah. when you're back in training legs, sure. right? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And um, I think one of the things you spoke about on the website as well is the specialization block training. Mm -hmm. This is something I wanted to kind of talk to you about because not everybody's perfectly symmetrical mm -hmm. and there's the perfect uh, physique. A lot of us have weak body parts and I think a lot of people don't maybe take as much attention as they could do to those specific body parts. So say for example, someone had a weak chest. Mm -hmm. What would you do with that person and how would you construct a, a specialization training block? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... The first thing to understand is that therefore you want the, the bulk of your work to be done, the bulk of your systemic recovery capabilities to be going through the chest mm -hmm. on that example. <coughs> so simply you're going to have two recovery markers here, you're going to have, or fatigue markers, you're going to have local fatigue, which is how much this one individual muscle group or muscle belly can recover from session to session, per session, adaptive volume, and you're also going to have systemic recovery capabilities, i.e. what can your nervous system drive adaptations to over the course of a training mesocycle. So when we talk about specialization, we're specifically talking about having as much space within those systemic recovery capabilities to grow that body part as possible. Mm -hmm. So the way that you would do that, like we said, finding what's minimally effective for you, you could have all of your other body parts just working at minimum effective volume. Okay, just to, for maintenance, for example. Well, by definition, what's minimally effective would be enough for you to grow. Okay. But you give a good example there, because some people are big enough in a body part, mm -hmm. so that would be maintenance. Sure. And, and you could have them just at maintenance, and that would give you more space for recovery of that one body part. So maybe you found that you've accumulated volumes up to like this 16, 18 sets per body part per week previously. You will most definitely find that if, let's say you leave these body parts on eight sets mm -hmm. per body part per week and you just accumulate the chest up and you don't accumulate anything else up, I guarantee you'll be working at the 20, 22, 24 sets per week, which is of course higher net hypertrophic stimulus. Mm -hmm. And you can accumulate that up to the point of overreaching just locally through the chest and you'll have the space to do that. Now, something to note on there is that things like the quality of the volume and that per session adaptive volume that we mentioned. Yeah. So if you're planning to run a specialization block, you do want to have the frequency set to support that, whether that be training that body part three or four times per week, or moving your session <coughs> to AM, PM. Mm -hmm. So you could just do, let's say this is chest. You could do chest in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yep. and you could have upper lowers on other days, wherever, in the mm -hmm. evening. But you're always training chest on its own fresh prioritizer with the high frequency. So everything's obviously prioritized on that weak muscle part training yeah. when you're doing it. And so everything else, again, like you say, minimum effective dose of... of or maintenance, yeah, or maintenance, that's up sure. to you. And would you then split-wise upper lower, or does it not really matter? Because it would depend on the body part being trained. Like, for example, I recently wrote a chest and bicep specialization mm -hmm. block where we were doing chest, biceps, chest, biceps, chest, biceps, that's six days a week, yeah. and they rotated, and they were AM sessions. Sure. And then we had <coughs> upper, lower, upper, lower on four evenings. Uh, okay. So that'd be a more extreme example. Mm -hmm. But let's say you want to run a leg specialization block. Lower, upper, lower, upper, lower. You know, it can be quite simple like that as well. But there would, if you're an individual that can accumulate up to greater volumes, understand that you'd probably end up having to split up quads and hands yeah. at that point. For sure, since that session would just probably end you. Yeah, <laughs> per session volume can get quite high on those yeah. specialization blocks. Yeah, we've done quite a lot of sets, three, three times a week, and then obviously, like you say, got to manage the recovery capabilities as well right. within that. What kind of markers do you do you look at when you're sort of monitoring that? Soreness. Mm -hmm. I like to use soreness as a marker of muscle damage. Performance. Are you able to <coughs> adhere to the progression scheme? Mm -hmm. And the pump to some degree. So, it, it, for example, as a very rough example, let's say you're doing that lower body specialization, but you train legs on Monday, 
you were a bit sore on Wednesday, on Tuesday, but on Wednesday you were fully recovered. Yeah. You've probably got room to move a bit up on legs on the Monday. And understand that the stimulus threshold goes up through a mesocycle as adaptations take place, which is why accumulation is probably sure. a good idea. Like with greater exposure to those volumes and with greater adaptations, you can have a greater stimulus. Demand adaptation, demand adaptation, right, every time. So, yeah. But if you have overlapping soreness, let's say you get to that Wednesday and your quads were still trashed, yeah, yeah. I probably wouldn't adjust the volume on that just quad. Keep it where it is. So, yeah. you just, so you just go up for that one session, for example, out of the three. And yeah. then maybe the next week you'll be like, oh, actually, maybe now we can add another set in yeah. session two. Yeah, so what, something that I'll have for clients, for example, is like a number rated system. Yeah. And I've seen Renaissance Periodization do this quite well. Mm -hmm. I should probably have a look at exactly how they do it. But um, I'll say like, if you were super, if you had overlapping soreness, um, give me a, a three. If you had, if you were a bit sore the next day, but recovered by the session, give me a two. If you didn't get sore at all, give me a one. Okay, cool. And then we'll adjust. Stuff. That's cool, and you know then when to add, or maybe leave it, or even pull back. Yeah, so I, the majority of my clients, I'll adjust their volume with each check-in. Mm -hmm. That's okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and how would you monitor the progression scheme itself? I'll have a progression scheme in place for that client and it would depend on the level of the client. So I've got some clients that will be adding like five kilos to the bar per week and they can Do you it. tell them Yeah, they'll have specific. So they know what weight they're coming yes. in, they like they know I've got to do this weight for this many reps. Yes, and then they'll tell me what kind of reps in reserve they have on those weights in the check in. So that's another okay. marker. So of so if for example you said right, three plates of side on the side bits hack, you're mm. doing eight reps. Yeah. If they get to eight and could have done nine, they, they stop. Yes. They stop at eight, okay. Yeah. And then you can you add over time then. Yeah, I can just based okay. on that. Rather than just bury yourself. Yeah, because then, then you do limit further progression. It's <clears throat> not about doing as much as you can do today. Mm -hmm. Very, do you know, this is a good lesson <clears throat> for bodybuilders all over. This is a lesson for me, bro. Right. Like, you know. <laughs> it's not about what you can do in this session. Of course. It's not about what you can do over the next eight weeks. Mm -hmm. It's about what we can do over the entirety of the off season. Mm -hmm. So having progression schemes in place that maybe you, you leave the gym feeling like you could have done more, that's okay because you're going to do more and you're going to do more and you're going to do more. And those adaptations are going to flow. And then it will eventually get to that point where you're like, right, now I'm fucked. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone gets there. And the thing is that you'll get more growth over the long term because you're not overreaching so acutely. Mm -hmm. If you bury yourself and then you overreach in two weeks and then need a week to recover, you've got a two to one paradigm. Sure. So two weeks of growing to one week of kind of some growth by super compensation, but not, not as much as if you were training. On the flip side, you could have done four or, or yeah, five yeah, yeah. accumulations or something like that. Honestly, genuinely, when you say it like that, it does make a lot of like general sense. Mm. Um, obviously, being a, you know, a meathead bodybuilder myself, you know, for years and years, I'd just go in and I would just do as much as I could on as much weight as I could for, mm. you know, in until I couldn't go anymore, and then obviously would repeat that. Um, but again, end up with, you know, injuries, um, struggle to recovery and stuff like that. So managing recovery and adaptation is really important. And this comes right back down to like nervous system innovation, um, which is quite boring, right? So it's quite boring, so I'm gonna go and train and try to not be emotionally charged. Mm. And so, you know, maybe on week one of my mesocycle, I'm trying to stay very calm, mm -hmm. You know, I'm just moving what I'm supposed to move, and it's just an action that I'm executing, and I'm not going to go in there and you know sniff some ammonia and go crazy, like you're and right scream, off. <laughs> yeah, have to do something. Yeah. But maybe I need that in week four. Yeah, and I, and it's a tool. It's good to have that in the, in the tank right. when you need it. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Yeah. That that for me would be something. Um, it would almost be hard to not. To, I did some RAR training before, and it was di it was quite difficult. Mm. Coming from always doing it, you know, giving everything till I've got nothing. Mm. Um, so doing that was it was difficult mentally to be like to put the weight down, you know, yeah. or not. And let's be clear, like training to failure has great utility. Like there's lots of benefits <coughs> of taking every set to failure. Like you basically guarantee that you're going to activate like mm -hmm. the massive majority of high threshold motor units that we know is associated <coughs> with greater rates of hypertrophy. But um, in general, it's it's better have an accumulation yeah yeah 100 no 100 I, I couldn't agree more and i think especially as for example with myself as i've got bigger and stronger um it's even more apparent how much more it's required from a recovery mm. standpoint especially the you know load you know increased load just causes more damage doesn't it so right, yeah <laughs> as you get bigger and stronger you just kind of put yourself into more of a hole but uh yeah, recovery capabilities are probably one of the most important and underrated aspects of training, I would say, especially with 
well, with, with the most bodybuilders, I'd say, mm. to be honest. Especially in big guys. Like a lot yeah. of the big guys I work with that are coming from a two sets per exercise background mm. that are really having trouble progressing mm -hmm. is emotionally divorcing from that system of training sure. and putting other vectors of progression in that allow them to still progress with like minimal joint forces and things like that. Which, mm -hmm. you know, longevity as a bodybuilder is extremely important. Very true. And I think uh, avoidance of we can't do shit if you're injured, can you? No, that's right. <laughs> you're not going to progress with a, with a, a torn muscle. So, uh, just a couple of you know, a couple of quick ones left. So, how else would you do? You, would you do any like set extension stuff? Any like metabolic work? You know, cluster sets, rest pauses, stuff like that. Yeah, and, I think. And when would you put that in? I think you certainly can. A couple of ways would either be as a progression scheme. Mm -hmm. So let's say right on week four. Well, this would be more aggressive, right? For people that really like training with higher intensities, we have a circuit on week one. We're going to take all our sets to like two reps in reserve, mm -hmm. which I think is like honestly quite easy to track. Yeah. Week two, you get like one rep in reserve, that's definitely easy to track. Week three, maybe you take all your sets to failure. In week four, maybe you'd add a rest pause mm -hmm. to those sets. So there's a progression scheme. Or in week one, with your lowest volumes, you could have a rest pause in place, or like a myo rep rest pause, or you know, whatever it may be, these like intensity techniques that you mentioned, but built into the reps in reserve. Okay. So, so I could say if you're on that Cybex hack, you're going to do a myo rep rest pause, which is where um, you're essentially just tagging one rest pause on there. Mm -hmm. You're going to take it to three reps in reserve, rack it, 30 seconds, take it to, or even 10 seconds, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. Rep, uh, rest interval you want to use, take it to three reps in reserve, but then next week we're going to go two. And we cut the one so it overloads itself. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you could either have it, I'd say either have it from the beginning of the mesocycle or use it as that progression scheme to jump. Sure. But at the end, to just kind of like finish it off, sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. No, it makes a lot of sense. No, I appreciate that. And uh, so we'll, we'll kind of do again, like what we did at the end of the last video, like kind of like some, say, practical takeaways with regards to considerations of training, specialization, and things like that. So mm -hmm. we'll let you finish up then, boss. Okay, so practical takeaways and what we've spoken about there is be aware that there's multiple drivers of hypertrophy and not being emotionally connected to any one of them will serve you great utility as a physique athlete so understand that volume is a driver of hypertrophy uh, intensity or i should say relative effort because intensity is a term that's used in, in research to describe loads so it can get confusing so you, effort your proximity to failure decreasing that is a vector of hypertrophy adding reps is a vector of hypertrophy even intraset volume via using machines with more favorable profiles with minimal joint forces or eliminating inertia all of these things are vectors of hypertrophy so use them all intelligently in a way that's going to limit injury risk so you're less injurious mm -hmm. points of progression and through your accumulation if we're talking about specialization maybe just accumulate those body parts and leave systemic or leave maximum <laughs> systemic recovery capabilities to those body parts. Awesome, awesome. So some good practical takeaways there, guys. I definitely took a lot from that. So if um, you guys want to subscribe, like, and comment below, also we'll get back to you with any questions. And remember, you can check out Joe's Instagram, check out his website, Physique Collective, and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot more on there too. So guys, cheers for checking out. Let's get